I invite you to pull out your insert and read together out loud with me the very last sentence on the bottom right where it begins with, he who has ears. Let's read that together. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. That's the basis for meditation this morning. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that each of us have been born with so many marvelous uh, features where we can hear and see and listen and taste and, and run and, and so many other things. But Lord, as we contemplate your word this morning and its message, may you not help us, help us to not just hear words and sounds, but touch our heart with your Holy Spirit, that it may move us to respond in ways that see your great love as something we can give everything that we own and have and do to follow. Lord, have your way, we pray now, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, our gospel lesson ended with the words you just read. He has ears to hear, let him hear. Sometimes there are things in life that we don't want to hear. Have you ever had that happen? Maybe it's news from a doctor or a financial advisor or something like that. But the, and the gospel lesson for this Sunday morning could be one of them, but I invite you, please listen. Just as a medical doctor is not trying to be mean when you are told the truth about what ails you, I'm convinced Jesus was not trying to be mean as he spoke to crowds long ago. He was being very truthful with them, as painful as that truth may have been. You heard me read them just a few moments ago, but listen again to the three times that Jesus tried to explain to the large crowd that gathered with him that day why a person could not be his disciples. This wasn't so much disqualifications in the sense that someone was too tall or too short, the weight wasn't altogether right, or their education requirements weren't up to snuff. No, it was more about commitment. Listen, first he said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Second, he said, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. And finally, he said, any of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. I invite us this morning in silence. Let those words sink in. Maybe take out your bulletin and reread them again and silently ponder the text for yourself. Take a moment to do that. What part of that text has caught your attention? What are you thinking? Are you trying to dissect the text in some way? Maybe you're thinking, well, what does he mean by cross? What does he mean by hate? What does he mean by renounce all that I have? Maybe you're wondering, is discipleship optional? Maybe you're wondering, why is he bringing up discipleship at all? Maybe some here this morning are asking, do I have to be a disciple? I'm praying that there's some here this morning that are saying to themselves as they listen to this text, oh boy! This is something I've always wanted to do. Sure, there is effort and sacrifice involved, but I've counted the cost, and the cost is going to be more than worth it. My hope and prayer is that this describes all of us here this morning. And if not, by the power of the Holy Spirit, who is among us, 
and by the authority of his word, he would persuade you that this is, in fact, what God wants for your life and mine. In many ways, the gospel lesson that's been appointed for this Sunday is a tough lesson. And I've heard many pastors, as I'm sure you have too, try to tone it down a bit. Try to explain away the kind of commitment that Jesus requires of his children. I, for one, believe that we should let Christ's word stand. If you have one of those Bibles, the red letter Bibles, these words are in red. The words of Christ Jesus himself. And I believe that Christ always says what he means. This may be an oversimplification, but I'm a kind of guy that likes it simple so I can remember it. As I look through those texts, and I invite you this week to do the same, it seems pretty clear to me that Jesus is asking for total commitment. He's looking for people that are completely sold out for him. Back when I returned from Vietnam and God was doing a work in the United States of America in every single denomination, his Holy Spirit was moving people in ways that hadn't been seen in a long time. Such people that were completely sold out for Jesus were called Jesus freaks. And this wasn't a compliment. There were people who were willing to sacrifice everything they were, everything they had, not to make a name for themselves, but because of the honor and joy given them in the deep, deep relationship they experienced through Christ Jesus their Lord. They knew that this was no ordinary commitment, as God knew through Jesus when he spoke it long ago. This is no ordinary commitment. He gives us our deaf ears the ability to hear. And he gives our hearts of stone a tenderness to be able to receive. As I think about this text and wrestle with it, this is the creator of the universe who personally calls each of us by name. He paved the way into eternity with his shed blood on the cross, and he invites us, as he did them long ago, to follow him. He actually calls you by name and is asking you to be his disciple. Can you imagine that? The one who spoke this world into existence, the one who sent his son to die and rise again, the one who gave us everything says, I want you to be my disciple. You might be thinking, me? Yes, you. Regardless of your age, regardless of where you are in life, regardless of your occupation. This is not a bait and switch offer, as sometimes maybe you've experienced that in a salesman that tries to dangle something out and then tells you the real cost. Jesus is up front with all of us, and he clearly informs us from the beginning that to follow him, to be his disciple is going to cost us everything. But in reality, as we receive the full counsel of God's word, he also shows us that all that we have has indeed been given to us by his gracious hand. Sometimes the reality of that is a little hard to sink in, but the Holy Spirit eventually does show us that. Our time, our talents, our treasures, our relationships, our very life are on loan from him, and we as stewards are given responsibility for each one of these resources. Scriptures tell us that our bodies were made by him, not simply to do with as we please, but to be his very temple. Our abilities, the skills that enable us to do our jobs that we take a break from this Labor Day weekend, are given to us by him. The families we were born into and the children that he has given us are his. When we think about it this way, God is not asking us for anything that is not already his. We are not our own. We have been bought with a price. 1 Corinthians 
Once our ears truly hear this, how can there be any response but love? You see, as we look at the Old Testament reading for today, where it says, see, I've set before you today life and good. And then as God went through three things he asks people to do, he begins by saying, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, above family and friends and job and sports and whatever it is. He wants and demands to be number one. He doesn't share his glory with anyone or anything. As you heard in our Old Testament lesson, God again says, I have set before you today life and good. He wants us to choose life, but sadly, he is clear in this same text that there are those who will instead turn their hearts away and choose death as they are drawn away to serve gods of their own imagination. And the culture and times in which we live, and I'm sure it's been so every time, every generation before us, entice us with so many things, so many gods of our own imagination, convincing us that we are masters of our own destiny, that our bodies are our own to do whatever we please, however we care, that the resources that we own are completely under our control. Most of us have lived long enough to know, well, that's not true. In an instant, God can take anything away from us, including our own life. I know that each and every one of us here today have been baptized, right? If you haven't been baptized, talk to me after the service, and we'll talk about what that means. But I'm going to assume for right now that every single one of us have been baptized. Did you know that discipleship is part of the package? Did your parents, your sponsors, your pastor and teachers explain this to you? Maybe we've heard it so often that even though we do have ears to hear, we have never heard it before. Jesus said in the last chapter of Matthew, verse 20 of chapter 28, and I'm sure everyone here could recite it from memory, go and make disciples. And he concludes by saying, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you. Tucked in this passage, that you who know it by memory would correct me because I didn't include it, tucked in this passage is baptism which we understandably like to emphasize. But brothers and sisters in Christ, we have failed Jesus and our God if somehow we separate baptism from discipleship, making them two totally different unrelated things, making it just a matter of getting into heaven with no real commitment, no intention whatsoever, absolutely no effort to become his disciples. That is not how God intended it. When Jesus gave that command to his disciples, he said to his disciples back then, he said, go and make disciples, and they told him how to do that. He sets before us today life, true life, life beyond anything we could ever experience, as wonderful as it is with our families, our friends, our jobs, everything that we own. He sets us before us today life. And I'm convinced, I know with all my heart, soul, and being that he has given us the power of his Holy Spirit to follow him, to actually be in this century, in this community, in this church, his disciples, bearing witness to his glorious name, seeing people's lives changed radically around, to become what God intended. Our text would have each of us ponder today, in what ways are we a disciple of Christ Jesus and not just part of that great crowd that gathered with him long ago and that gathers continually in the times in which we live just to hear him speak, 
just to hear a good message. Jesus wants disciples. Let each of us, as the Old Testament lesson instructed people long ago and us today, choose life in Christ. The very first step in this journey of discipleship begins as the Holy Spirit moves us to love the Lord our God with all of our hearts, with all of our strength, with everything that we have, because he's done such a wonderful, wonderful, marvelous job of making us his very own by dying and rising again. Amen. May the peace of God that passes all understanding keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus.